Victoria Atkins, you must be disappointed that the conflict has started again in Gaza after the truth. After the truth. Um, we are playing a part here. What exactly are our military aircraft doing in Gaza? Well, of course, the UK government was very supportive of humanitarian pauses because whilst we absolutely support uh, Israel's right to uh, defend itself, um, we also acknowledge, of course, there are human humanitarian repercussions in Gaza itself and indeed across Israel. And so uh, we were very much advocating for those pauses to continue. Uh, in terms of the uh, military hardware that is in the region, uh, the Ministry of Defence has announced that it has sent some unmanned and, importantly, unarmed surveillance drones into the region to help look for hostages, because having had around 100 hostages released, of course, there are still many, many more who are being held captive by Hamas, and we want to do everything we can uh, to help uh, find those hostages and, and to secure so, their release. Let me take, take you up on one thing, if I may. You've started by talking about humanitarian pauses. It's very interesting, the change of tone from you. The American vice president yesterday issued a warning to Israel that there'd already been too many killings. Um, Lord Cameron was out there last week. Did he say to the, where, the Israelis that they are risking British and American support uh, if the loss of civilian life keeps rising in Gaza? Well, I, I hope you'll appreciate I, I won't uh, uh, trespass on conversations that the Foreign Secretary may have had with his counterparts, but certainly the international community throughout this, even in the immediate aftermath of the horrors of October the 7th, were saying that, of course, Israel, as the only democracy in the region, will be wanting to act within international law. But, you know, we're seeing again and again the awful, awful humanitarian crisis that is um, unfolding in terms of Hamas's treatment of people. Uh, only yesterday, Janice Turner had an extraordinarily shocking article about how rape is being used as a weapon of war uh, by Hamas, and it is these sort Sorts of crimes that we very much uh, want to support the international community in supporting Israel. There, there's no question about the degree of horror that yeah. people have for what Hamas did, and that's where this started. No question about that. But it seems to me that the UK and the USA are beginning perhaps to run out of patience with Israel. I, 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 again, um, we stand absolutely steadfast with Israel, but we have always said that this must happen within international law. Okay. Uh, and so we want, we were very, very supportive of the humanitarian pauses. Um, and we very much hope that okay. Hamas will get right back round the table and uh, agree to more of these pauses and release more hostages. They, are, they could end this tomorrow. All right. Today, even. All right, you've been in your role as health secretary for about, what, two weeks now? Um, Extraordinary. You've met your target for nurse recruitment and GP appointments. You've settled a strike. Um, that's all good news. But you have also pointed out in the last couple of days that there is a difficult winter ahead. Prime Minister's promised to slash waiting lists. How's that going? Well, just if I may, just on my first couple of weeks, um, it's been an absolute privilege to be appointed to this role. I, I came into politics. One of the reasons I came into politics was uh, because of the NHS and the way it's looked after me and my family. So it's a genuine privilege, but also a huge responsibility. And I'm also conscious that um, there's an enormous amount of teamwork that goes on across NHS England, across the Department of Health, and, of course, my predecessors, to achieve the manifesto promise that we've achieved this week of 50,000 more nurses and so on. Yeah, but let's come but to winter now. in terms of the winter crisis, uh, of course, this is my uh, absolute priority uh, over the coming months because we know that the NHS, like every other healthcare system in fairness, struggles in the winter with temperatures dropping and the impact that has on people's health. And so we have set in uh, place our urgent and emergency care plan. And we've started preparing for winter before we were preparing uh, last winter for this. And we are seeing already in the system, uh, we are beginning to meet our target of 5,000 more beds in, the, in hospitals to try and uh, get, get through some of those delays that we've I, I'm seen. I'm going to come to some of the details in a second, but um, I'm interested that you are using the word crisis already. Um, well, is that where we are? 
Well, I only no, not not no, not at the moment. But again, I, I do understand the challenges that the NHS will face over the coming months. I think we all do. We all acknowledge that as winter comes in, we have more respiratory uh, illnesses. We have uh, physiological impacts of cold temperatures on uh, people, particularly if they have pre pre existing yeah. conditions. So we're trying to prepare for that. But I do acknowledge the challenges that everybody will be facing across the, the NHS. The issue is whether the system can can cope. Um, is it right that coroners have three coroners have already written to you saying you've got to get ready for uh, the winter because they're already they're already seeing ambulance delays that have caused unnecessary deaths? Well, I was very, very concerned to um, uh, understand that, but also, of course, as a con as a rural constituency MP, I know. Uh, how difficult it can be in very rural areas for ambulances to get to people on time. Uh, and this is why, through our winter planning, we, will, uh, we are bringing 800 new ambulances uh, on board. That will help. And we have already this month seen um, some improvement, actually, from this time last year. Our Category 2 ambulance times, which is the measure we tend to use, they're some 19 minutes faster than they were this time last year. But, of course, but... I'm not resting on my laurels with that. We need to do... All right, well, let, let's take into the, the details of this just a, a little bit. Okay, you, the ambulance gets people to the hospital. That doesn't mean they're going to get into a, a bed. Uh, let, let me just tell you what the NHS England's own statistics said. In 2014, the total number of people who had to wait 12 hours for a hospital admission after a decision had been taken to admit them was 489, under 500 in 2014 for a whole year. In October this year, just one month that was warmer than usual, the average number of people had to wait over 12 hours was 1,440, nearly three times as many a day. And that's each day is this month, in that month. What are your plans to cope with it? It's a whole different scale. Um, so this is part of the uh, longer-term pressures on the NHS. So what we are doing to address this is almost looking at the end rather than the beginning because if we can move people out of the system more quickly, then the flow through the hospitals, <coughs> forgive me, it, it is much, much smoother and quicker. So with uh, hospital discharge... But the scale of it is, is uh, extraordinary, isn't it? Uh, well, we have 11 million inpatients a year, so the scale of the NHS is is unique around the world. Of course, it is, but it is also unique because of the uh, the very fact that our care is free at the point of use, and and that will okay. continue for as long as I'm uh, alive. Um, the, 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 this means that we have um, we are able to measure this in ways that perhaps other right. areas aren't able to. But the key to this is hospital discharge, and we there are some areas now because of the plans that have gone into winter planning already, but also, importantly, um, the further £600 million of investment that we've put into social care this year. Systems around the country have been able to plan, and there are some areas it's... now where there aren't those delays of oh. submitting into social care, but, of course, there is more to do in every... Well, well let's area. talk about that, because the other big obstacle in, your, um, in meeting your uh, ambitions is the workforce. Now, the latest figures from September show that you've got 121,000 or more... Uh, and more vacancies, that's about 10% of the NHS workforce. Um, and in June this year, 265,000 of those people came from abroad. That's more than the year before. Um, now, your colleague, Mr Hunt, sat in that seat a couple of weeks ago and told me he wants immigration numbers down. If he gets his way, where are those 265,000 foreign workers in the NHS? And by the way the uh, similar number in social care are going to come from. You're never going to meet your targets if he gets his way on immigration. Well, all of our workforce, whether they are um, UK nationals or they have come from overseas to work in our NHS and social care system, uh, are incredibly important to the system, and I genuinely um, thank them for their service. In terms of immigration as a whole, uh, it is too high, okay. uh, and um, but you we can't have, have taken... Ways. But but. There's more to immigration than simply health and social care visas. So this year we um, unveiled a, a, a genuinely game-changing policy of removing dependents from student visas. They take up quite a oh, proportion okay, okay. of... Okay. Of let me show you something. Let me show you something. Let, let, ha, take a look at this graph here. A great number of the people that you're missing, about a third, are nurses. Where are the nurses coming from? 
Those red bars are foreign nurses. And this year, 2023, half of the uh, new nurses that come into the system are from abroad. So let me put it to you again. If Mr Hunt gets his way to cut immigration, you'll never meet your targets because you will not have those nurses. Well, uh, this is where the long-term workforce plan comes into effect. And uh, earlier this year, we announced the long-term workforce plan for the whole of the NHS. Okay. So I see it as the sort of building blocks for the next okay. 75 years of the NHS. And the focus on this is about training our nurses and doctors here in the UK and supporting them and retaining them okay. uh, through innovative measures such as uh, nursing apprenticeships, uh, shorter degrees. But you're not, not going to fix this but, this winter. But we will... This is for the medium to longer term. We okay. have recruited our nurses and our social care workers. They play an incredibly important part in our health right. system. Uh, and okay. uh, we are working across government to tackle immigration because we understand it's, it's of great concern. Oh, but we right. can do this in a way that um, protects the NHS. Let, let me just quickly ask you about one other thing, which in a way goes back to your last job as Attorney General. Um, I, I was... I was, I was uh, financial sector treasury. Sorry, Sorry. <laughs> financial sector to treasury. Okay, well, Where you're also interested in the Im immigration and so on. Now, um, the government's apparently putting some more money into the system to make the Rwanda deal, to sweeten the Rwanda deal. Um, I don't think that's been confirmed yet. I think well, that's speculation. It is speculation. It's mm. reported. Mm. Okay. Um, the only person who seems to be on their way to Rwanda actually is the Home Secretary James Cleverly. There's no asylum seekers going there anytime soon. Um, again, when he was here, he told me that he was going to introduce emergency legislation urgently to make it possible to send asylum seekers to Rwanda for processing. And that was weeks ago. Where's that emergency? It can't be that much of an emergency because we haven't seen the legislation. Well, it was right that we took time to read the Supreme Court's judgment carefully to understand uh, the points that they raised. Um, we, we, of course, respect that judgment, but we uh, don't agree with it in that we think we can set out the case. Uh, and it was important because the Supreme Court acknowledged that uh, it was um, perfectly proper to send people to a third country to um, decide our uh, asylum claims. But in terms of Rwanda, that we are very much working across government on this. It will take a little bit of time to draw up this legislation because we want to make sure right. it's the right, in the right okay. form. But it's, uh, so, so we're not going to see anything very soon, are we? Uh, I'm, I'm, no legislation for Christmas. I know that the Home Secretary is working incredibly hard and right. quickly on this. All right, well, one last thing. Um, you must have read this morning that the leader of the opposition has praised Mrs Thatcher for dragging us out of our stupor as a country, the introducing entrepreneurialism, and he's inviting conservative voters to come across. Are you thinking about crossing the floor? <laughs> Because uh, Labour has gone Thatcher, right? Uh, I, I think the public will see this for what it is. I think it's... You know, this, don't forget, he wasn't uh, appealing to Margaret Thatcher's entrepreneurial spirit when he was courting votes from the hard left. And I suspect the great lady herself uh, would uh, view a man who is trying to ride on the coattails of her success with the following words, no, no, no. <laughs> Victoria Atkins, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. <laughs>